whoever's listening to this, if you feel like you're in that rut, just ask yourself, like, what can you control today? What can you start with right now? And stay consistent with it over a 30-day period, a 60-day period, and you will see results in some capacity. It might not be instant. It's no different than everyone right now is going back to the gym. Everyone's getting back into shape. They're trying to. Everyone's doing the 75 hard. Can you actually do that for 365? Bro, so you ran across Korea. (laughs) That is an absurd statement on itself. What in the world compelled you to do that? Yeah, um, it is absurd. It's a little crazy. It's a little out there, which is right up my alley. Um, Truthfully, I wanted two things. One, an opportunity to go seek more of like my culture and a place that my parents grew up and my grandparents grew up and it's a place that I didn't grow up um but it's where my family's heritage is and I think there's that the first layer of this cultural homecoming of like okay like I haven't been back to Korea since I was seven years old it's been 21 years I can't even barely remember what it was really like when I went and then the second piece is this challenge it's a physical, a mental, a spiritual challenge of I've put my body through the ringer, through chosen suffering, and now it was another opportunity to be like, okay, we're gonna close the year out with this bang of a project and see what we're, we can do. And I went there underplanned, undertrained, a lot of things that you know didn't go my way. And it's just how I show up in life. It's not having all the plans figured out. It's the unknown. It's being comfortable in it. And understanding that you're going to grow through that. And I think that's truly been my story. It's I've never thought of half the stuff I've been able to accomplish. It's it's it never was like I'm going to grow 100,000 followers on Instagram. I'm going to run marathons. Like so much of the things that happened in my life, bro, were just like it was me leaning into the uncomfortability and stepping into the unknown and being comfortable not having the answers. And that was this trip in Korea. I didn't know what type of hospitality and love that I would get from Korea or like the runners there or that community. I just was stepping in and and once again, to what we even said earlier before we even recorded, like I'm just showing up as myself into the world and allowing the world to kind of match that energy. Dude, and you're coming from love and you, you have, you exude and radiate true abundance and love for everyone around you. And that's why so much goodness it seems like it's flowing your way because of the energy that you're putting out into the world. And so there's so much I want to talk to you about, Korea. And I'm curious, like, you, what, how, how, give us the height and weight for Matt Choi in this moment. I am 6'2", 190 pounds. 6'2", 190 pounds. So when I told my dad, when I told my grandpa that my friend is running across Korea, they're like thinking that what they are about to witness or see is like this small dude. And it's actually like a former college football player. <laughs> it's just a beast. And so it's like, you're doing these crazy things and you're also doing it from a place of like, this is not what you're meant to do as a football player. This is not, and so there, there's a really cool element of like, you're doing it all with love and you're doing it all the way, something you're not supposed to do or breaking the the mindset of what mm. people expect. So let's uh, let's dive into Korea. And let's dive into the the most difficult moment of the 10 days, the yeah. 300 miles. It was 10 days, right? Yeah, 10 days. 10 days, 300 miles. Mm-hmm. It's a crazy <laughs> thing to say and on itself. 10 days, 300 miles. What was the hardest part? The hardest part was after the fifth day, you've accumulated now basically half the distance, about 150 miles. And at that point, Danny, like the furthest I ever ran was 100 miles in 30 hours. Right, which is still a significant distance. But now a lot of these distances were anywhere from 20 miles to 40 miles every day. And just based on the location and based on where we're gonna be stopping at in the next small town or whatever it is, but you're accumulating a lot of mileage day to day to day to day. And obviously like our bodies are machines. They truly are. They're malleable, they're adaptable, and it can withstand a lot of stress. But obviously, as you build up this stress and after five days, I started getting a lot of pain in my foot and it actually started to show itself on day four. And this is how smart the body is. Like it started as calf pain in my left calf. And I'm like, oh, it's like 
now I'm like, I'm limping a little bit. I'm like taking a little bit, like I'm slowing my pace down and, and I'm like, I'm low key mentally starting to like, tr like, there's like stress responses triggering. It's like a check engine like that pops up and you're like, I could keep driving here. Is it smart? Probably not, but I can keep moving this car. I can keep moving my body. After the day four was done, I was like, okay, like I need to spend some extra time. Let's, let's refuel up. And I need to like stretch. I need a foam roll. I need a massage gun. And the fifth day I was like, oh, the cat feels a little better. And it was, I, I did a proper warm up, And then as I went through the fifth day, I had this like chronic pain in the top of my foot, like where not your metatarsals, like your toes, but like the, the actual base of the foot. Uh -huh. And on the top or bottom? On the top. Wow. And it felt like needles every single time I would take a step. And obviously all the mental doubt, all the uncertainty of shit, like I'm actually now like my body is starting to respond and it's breaking down. And it was a moment of physical breakdown in addition to the mental of like, how am I gonna accomplish five more days of this? So that was like the toughest moment because in that, in that day, I had a 29 mile day and Danny, it was the slowest day. It, it, it took us, I was running like four, 13 minute miles. Wow. So it was a lot of walk, a lot of jog, a lot of walk, a lot of jog. And obviously now the entire team is having to be out there longer. Right, because like now they're just uh, they're waiting for me to just get done, and ideally in in this in these in the career trip, we had a pretty good system down, where we would typically start right at like nine thirty ten, and we would probably get done right around five, and it takes us typically like five to six and a half hours because I'm stopping to eat X Y and Z, and we're resting and, and taking breaks here, but that was the hardest day mentally and physically where I started to question is it smart to continue doing this? Because I'm fully about, unlike Goggins, not breaking your body off, not like putting yourself so far down the ringer where you're gonna really hurt yourself for the future, right? And I think so much of what I've done is about sustainability, it's about recovery, it's about running pain-free. And this is the first moment where I'm like, damn, like now how am I gonna overcome this? And so where does your mind go? I mean, a lot of places, honestly, but I think this most simplest thing, it, it goes to exactly where my feet are. I can't tell you how many times I said like, yo, let's just focus on one kilometer, one mile, just the focus of today. Because when you start thinking about, I have 160 more miles, your brain can't wrap around that distance in the current moment of I'm dealing with calf pain and foot pain and now my knee is flaring up because I'm overcompensating and all these things. And I know the body well in the sense that I was formerly a trainer and a nutritionist and I've been in the exercise science space in addition to the truest way I believe to know your body is to put it through stress that only you understand. Every human has a level of a, a pain tolerance. You put yourself through a workout, you put yourself through the pool, cold plunge, sauna, like you understand, oh, I can last 10 minutes in the water. I could be in the sauna for 30 minutes. I could run an ultra marathon. But until you actually do that, you don't really know what I'm capable as a human. So for me, when I start feeling these injuries, I start to know that like, okay, like now this is where the actual race begins. Hmm. This is where the mental warfare, the physical warfare starts to come into play because now you're not just playing a game of, oh, it's fun to go run a marathon at Boston and Chicago and New York. Like now you're going to get your body and your own mind. And I think the thing I kept telling myself and the team was like, guys, like let's just take it a day at a time. And I'm gonna just reassess how my body's feeling. And I'm just gonna continue to do that every five minutes, every 30 minutes, every hour. And I'm just gonna feel how my body is responding. And over time, dude, that mentality of being where your feet are, being present, understanding that you can't change the past and you can't dictate the future, it's actually how I live every day. And it, it brought me back to this moment of pain and suffering and, and torture that I'm putting my body through to, to achieve this feat. But that's the first thing I told myself was, Stay where you are, be where your feet are. And that was my focus. I can't tell you how many times I said one K at a time, one kilometer at a time. And I just said, I, I just kept having these mantras in my head. And we've talked about mantras from, from our last uh, chat. And I just had all these things that just kept re like playing in my head of like, this is what I do, mm -hmm. like one step at a time. And like, I just kept all these little sayings that just got me through two minutes of work, three minutes of work, and then I'd walk. And I'd have to find a little more energy to go for five more minutes. And I just kept stacking that mentality and that presence day to day to day. And we got to the finish line, which is un like unbelievable.
There's so much here. Okay, so one thing that comes to mind is like, what is it like then to have people support you and run with you on that journey? It's special. The first day, bro. Like, yeah. we'll insert some video footage of the of first day. Of course. Right here, as well as the sixth, seventh, eighth, or ninth day when this this yeah. man starts joining you and running with you. And you have this moment where this guy recognizes you and wants to start running and he becomes your friend. And it's just like, okay, explain all of that and what it's like yeah. to run with people. I mean, Danny, this is the true power of the running community and also having people along with you in any journey, business, entrepreneurship, running, hobbies, whatever it is. Like, it's undeniable that humans need each other in some capacity. As much as I enjoy solitude and as much as I enjoy my own time, like there's always a time and a place for that. And I think every human should find their balance. The first day we had about 25 people, a friend of mine, Isaiah, who helped coordinate a lot of my logistics for this trip had, he brought out his friends. He told his friends, cause dude, a lot of people don't follow me in Korea yet. And I think it's one of those things where for me, this was a selfish trip of, I want to go seek more of the culture and also dive into the community there. And I wanted to immerse myself in it. First day, we had about 25 people and all of them ran different distances. Some of them ran 10 miles. Some of them ran 20 miles, 30 miles. People hopped in at different points. And it was so fun. Dude, on the first day, Danny, you're like, yo, energy's high, body feels good. You know, like you're you're enjoying yourself. You have a lot of people you can talk to, a lot of distractions. And um, I quickly realized if we're thinking about from Seoul to Busan, Seoul is 10 million people. It's one of the major cities in Korea. Danny, all these small towns in between don't have a lot of young people. There's not running clubs. There's not organizations. Like, wow. like there's not a lot of young people because everyone moves to the biggest cities, Busan and then Seoul. Mm. So I was going, I was at, in the biggest city going to the second biggest city. Wow. In between, it was hard to get the community involved because there's really not many people. Wow. All you see is agricultural and farming and older people and they're all working in the farms. You're not seeing people in their 20s and 30s. How much did you know that going in? Very little. Okay. Very little. Cause like, even when I was in Korea 21 years ago, I was mainly in Seoul with my, my dad's side of the family. So I never really, dude, most people don't ever experience this sh the things that we saw. Even people that live in Korea, like how, not many people are going through foot into these small towns. Wow. And I didn't really know what it was going to be like in these areas, but I knew that Korea was very rural. It's so much of it is agriculture. So we started to get an idea as we start, as I talked to some other people that have done this or bike this, like they were saying that, like, yeah, like the, the middle of Korea is pretty empty. Wow. So that was day one. We didn't have someone else run with us until day six. Wow. So <laughs> five days in a row. And day four, you start to feel the pain. Yeah. Like real pain. So day four or five. It's just low, six, scary hours. Scary hours. <laughs> the dark place, as Zach Pograb would say. A hundred percent the dark place. It, I mean, Danny, I, as positive as I am, as optimistic as I am, in those moments is where I'm truly getting tested. And it's actually what I was seeking in some capacity. As crazy as that might sound, it's in those moments where I feel as if I'm growing. Like I'm actually to the Hormozzi quote of, you build confidence by having an undeniable proof of, or hold on, hold on, we got to say this again. We got to say this proper. Yeah. Um, you don't build confidence by shouting affirmations out in the mirror, yeah. but by building an undeniable stack of proof that you are who you say you are. Yes. In that moment, it's me building my undeniable stack of proof that this is who I am. I don't need validation through social. I don't need validation from people telling me, Matt, you're so dope. This is so tough. Like in that moment, Danny, of, my, of day four and day five, where I'm literally limping and I'm asking myself, can I continue? Can I keep walking? Like what? What's my plan if I can't run? How do I change the strategy to complete this mission? Like that's the conversation I'm having. It's not in a mode of like, oh, I'm gonna quit. It's just, hey, if, I, if it takes me two days longer, so what? Like I'm not coming here so someone could tell me that you did a good job and you did it in the days you said you were. Like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that was the hardest part. Obviously, you get people to come run with you. Dude, it's a beautiful thing, man. Even when I was suffering, for some reason, when I had people running with me, I felt like I had an armor, another armor on where I'm like, oh, like now I have someone holding me accountable. Now I have people holding me accountable and I don't want to let them down in, in a sense, but also I'm going to try to push and see like, can I get this done faster so we can all recover? Like the faster I get done, the faster the entire team gets to recover. And you know, people sacrifice their time and their schedule to, to help me accomplish this feat. 
And they all got to be a part of it, whether it was my internal team or people that came and, and wanted to run. And it was just, a, it was a special thing, man. I'd be lying if I didn't say that the days that people ran with me truly impacted me and how I responded and how my body responded without a doubt. Dude, I, it makes me think about when Mike Posner walked across the country, he was saying to himself before he went, what you're doing right now, what you're attempting to do, the reason why you're going is to feel the pain because from that pain is how you transcend. Mm. And he knew that from the jump. And so knowing that from the jump, if just like that actual dark place is where you become an even bigger light, which is really a special thing. Take me through like what it was actually like to get to the end. I mean, it was like two things I feel like. One, it was like a sigh of relief of one, I had never been to Busan and Busan is like a beach town. It's beautiful. It's kind of like San Francisco. Um, very hilly, which is god awful at the very end of this at the end of this journey. Um you know why I loved it the most, Danny? Because there was no one at the end. There was no one that was like with the finish line that you run through and you're like, I did this thing. And then people are there to cheer you and support no, you. And people were, there was a, there was a lot of people there because we went to a train station to end this. But people were just in awe of like, what is, what are these guys doing? I was shirtless in Korea. It's not, it's frowned upon to be shirtless, which apologize. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I was shirtless, Danny, running in with my brother on a bike. And then my buddy Ahmed, who was also on a, with the camera running. And I was just so proud of accomplishing this feat because no different than how I feel about everyday life, Danny, and, and how I approach life. It's like, I'm a, I want to be a person that's a man of his word. Yeah. I said, I'm going to do something. I say, I'm going to build a business. I say, I'm going to do this. I say, I'm going to run a marathon. I say, I'm going to run a marathon every single month. Like, I'm going to stay true to who I am, not for anyone else. It's just because I said, I'm going to do it. Yeah. And in that moment of coming to that finish line, I, the, the end destination, yeah. I loved how I was just so satisfied with the effort and the attitude that I brought that was then contagious to the team, which then was contagious to every single human that we interacted with from Seoul to Busan. That is actually what I was the most proud of. There was no finish line. There's no cameras. There's no, sh like, in, I mean, we had my own cameras, yeah. but I'm saying there's no one out there that was like, oh my God, good job. Yeah. No one had understood what we just did. They just thought there was this shirtless tan runner who looks kind of like Korean, but he's probably American. And, and like, you know, but you know what I'm saying? Like there was, there was no applaud. There's nothing. And, and I didn't do any of this for that. And I think that was the biggest thing for me was like getting to that, getting to that end destination and understanding that like, this is exactly who I am. It's just being someone that's a man of their word. And that I think it's, it transcends further than, than an applaud or, or celebration. Um, but yeah, that was probably the biggest, that that was what was going in my head. In addition, obviously, to the fact of just being human, Danny, I wanted to be done. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like I, I don't know how else to put it. Like, I got to, I saw it, I told my brother, because we got lost. Because, yes. dude, Busan is so hilly. Yeah. We were on roads that were navigating through the road, but, dude, some of the roads are not pedestrian friendly. So, me and my buddy Ahmed, we had to start climbing, like, different parts of Busan, which, bro, after you just ran 26 miles, oh my you're still having to climb, you're just like, yo... Every single step I was making, I could barely, I was limping. So there was a level of satisfaction to get to that point and just say, shit, like we were here. Wow. That, I mean, that's remarkable. I, I highly recommend everyone check out the full 46 minute documentary that was made and posted on your YouTube channel. It's linked below. I felt so inspired after. I was like, what can I do? You know, what am I capable of? And the fact that you have it all there, that it's documented is such a beautiful thing. And it's such an amazing thing to witness how it all comes about. You talk about being a man of your word. You were, you said to yourself, I'm, I'm going to run 12 marathons in 12 months. Yeah. I get a text on December 30th. Do you want to run a marathon tomorrow? And I was like, no, no, I don't want to run a marathon tomorrow. Are you kidding me? That is that sounds like the dumbest thing in the world. I got 14 miles planned. I got a marathon February 18th that I'm training for and being diligent about. I don't want to run a marathon. Get out of here with that. And then I thought about it some more. Thought about it some more. And really sat in the silence of what God was calling me to do. 
and surrendering to the moment. I just read the surrender experiment by Michael Singer, where this man starts meditating in the woods at 20 years old and ends up becoming a billionaire by saying yes to the flow of life. Mm. And I was like, the flow of life right now is telling me to run a marathon. (laughs) So let's run a marathon. (laughs) So I love that. dude. Dude, I have to just thank you because it was watching that, that documentary, and then going directly to like, all right, Matt's texting me about the very thing that I just saw him accomplish. So like, let's go. So first of all, thank you for- I appreciate you joining me. Yeah. I mean, that was a December 31st, 2023 is a day I'll never forget. We ran a marathon. Like one of my together. Favorite, one of my favorite marathons of the year. Wow. Dude, I want to I wanna break down that experience for you. Like what was- what was that like? Was that just another day in the office for you? I mean, that was one of your slowest ones with me. Then you're like, yeah, this is normal. But like, what is it? What was your perspective like of running an entire marathon with someone? There's, yeah, I mean, I, I think there's in one aspect, Danny, it is like literally, it's just another day in the office yeah. is how I treat it. That's how I treated it as well. Yeah. And, I, you know, for, for, for a lot of people, man, they, I'm getting to the point where I'm almost becoming unrelatable for a lot of people. Yeah. That, I want to talk to you about that. Yeah. That it, and I, and then I continue to do content to try to make it very relatable. Yeah. And that's always my push and pull is because now as, as you do these things, it almost seems unbelievable to most. Yes. There's a few that understand it. There's a, a smaller few that are like, that's little, that's light work compared to what they do. Right. There's the, that's the spectrum, which I'm not talking or speaking to those people. Yes. To me, that day was me overcoming my own doubt. Mm. Danny, if I didn't run that marathon on December 31st, I would have been content. My year would not have been more made, less made. All that happened was an experience with a core friend and a, it's a core memory now. It's all that, that's what happened on that day. But so much of it was, I wanted to just see. I had, I never, before I ever ran the 12 marathons in 12 months, I didn't know I was going to do this until what happened to me almost 365 days ago at the Houston Marathon. Wow. That when was I, the start. Bro, that was a start. When I got accused of being the bib mule and I was like, damn, like, uh, like I'm really getting shit for this, you know? Yeah. Then I ran Austin because every year I run Austin just because it's a hometown race. And then I, I was like looking at my calendar and I had Boston, I had Chicago and I had these races lined up and th- th- it was after running Houston and Austin that I said, you know what? Can I run a marathon a month? Mm. Can I do it? And no different than when I first did the Goggins challenge, when I first ran my first 50 mile or 100 mile, like it's always that question, like what if, yeah. what if you could do it? And it's like, and I got that from Goggins, right? It's like reading, when, when I read this book, it's like, what if? That what if mentality can take someone from thinking that they can't do something to then at least attempting it. And I said it in the doc, Danny, like I truly believe in my heart. Most people don't even give them a chance to attempt something. And if I can get someone to even have that framework of let me just go see, I don't have the answers of how I can run a mile. I don't know how to run a mile. I don't know how to run a 10K, a half marathon, whatever the challenge, whether it's in business, in running, in hobbies, whatever it is, to give someone liberation or confidence to go try something is what I'm about. And if someone could hear my story or see what I've done, and I'm not an expert, I'm not an elite runner, I'm not any of these things, yeah. but I'm just so being who I am. Like this is just, I'm just being authentically myself and showing up and doing the work to give myself a level of confidence to go try it. So to answer your question, it was just another day at the office, but I, I would have been okay with not doing it. I told my brother five, day, five days before, he's like, dude, what do you think? Are you gonna do it? Cause he, he was going back to Maryland. He wanted to film it. And I was like, I was like, I don't know. I'm gonna see how my body feels. My Achilles has been a little bit flaring. I'm very mindful when I have these injuries that I don't wanna overdo things to make it worse because I have a, a goals of 24 that I wanna hit and me running another marathon could f- do something and, and to interfere with those goals. So I started, I've been treating my body very well the past six weeks since I've been back and the Achilles felt a little bit better for some reason, Danny, it felt good that day. And I don't know if that's God working in mysterious ways or if it's timing or what it is, but sometimes when we have to put ourselves in those moments to just say, let's just go see. And once again, to what I said earlier, it's like, I've set out a goal to do a certain thing. I don't, it's not that I would have been, it's not that I would have thought that 2023 would be a failure if I didn't do a marathon in December. It's just the fact that I wanted to go try. 
and I wanted to go attempt it. Dude, it's so powerful. And the thing is, it's like, I didn't know I was that type of person until I get that text and I'm like, all right, you have 12 hours to prepare your mind for this thing. And then I told the people in my life that, my mom, my dad, my grandpa, my grandma, and they're like, that that's so unrelatable. You know, like they were shocked and in awe, but I'm like, yeah, but I'm just a guy. Yeah, I didn't start running. I wasn't running six months ago. Yeah. Seven months ago. Eight. It's like, this is new to me. And so, but that put me in their mind in a different category. But, and so I'm curious, like, what could you say to that person who's like, this is wild. This is crazy. This is like unbelievable to get them curious about the potential for themselves. <laughs> I love that. Um, shout out to the Miranda family. <laughs> the greatest. <laughs> the greatest. Truly the greatest. I can't wait to meet all of you guys. Um, I, I mean, Danny, everyone has a different starting point. Yeah. You've put in the work for the past six months. When I texted you, and I texted a couple other people because I know what I'm asking for is a lot. <laughs> like, honestly, like, I, I, that, Danny, that text doesn't go out to the a, a whole address book. Yeah. A very small percentage. Yeah. And a smaller percentage that's even willing to consider. And then from the people even considering, a very few from there that would actually go do it. So, in terms of relatability, I mean, it's a very unrelatable. Yeah. People, people's North Star for the year, Danny, is to run one marathon. It's maybe to run one half marathon. So for me to say on the last day of the year with no preparation, with no in with no prep of even carb loading or like giving anyone enough time. Four words at 325 PM. <laughs> Wanna run marathon tomorrow. <laughs> um it's one of those things where it's no different than the career trip, Danny. Mm. It's the unknown. It's putting yourself in a position to potentially fail. The closer you get as humans to a better relationship with failure, the more you will start to see amazing things in your life. Yes. And that's what I truly believe. You, you might not have been ready that day. You could have cramped. You could have had an injury pop up and maybe that would have feeded doubt for you not to run Austin. Maybe that would have now restructured your whole plan of running on February 18th, which is very, very viable. At the same time, what also could have happened is that you have a moment that, a light bulb moment that realizes that, oh, I can run two marathons in one month. I've been training for six months and now my body has adapted. I've ran an ultra marathon. Danny ran two miles to get to this meeting point where I met him at, and then he ran 26.2. So I think at any moment, when you say yes to these things that you don't have the answers to, it's saying yes to maybe failing, but it's also saying yes to maybe succeeding and seeing something that changes the trajectory of how you think, the way that you live. And I think that, Danny, is worth the risk. It's worth the price of admission of saying, I'll try. Yes. Period. Yes, dude, that is so, that's so brilliant and so wise because I think in the culture of caution, I like that. The culture of caution is almost what we've entered into of like, be careful here. Yeah, yeah. No, don't take a risk. In the culture of caution, push the edge of the envelope to see what you are capable of. Because if you don't do it, if, or if you don't have a friend like Matt Choi who's going to ask you, do it yourself. I was like, when I was running that, I said to myself like, oh, I literally could have been this person anytime I wanted to. I literally could have just run 28 miles whenever I wanted to. And like, it took Matt getting that out of me to show myself what I was actually capable of mm. by asking the question of being curious. Hey, do you have this within you? And I was like, wow, like if you're, you don't like your circumstance, you can change it by challenging yourself. Like mm. when I go back and watch your old videos, it's like you doing a Murph a day, you doing pull-up challenges, you trying different things. I'm like, oh, like. He's getting himself into a new situation by challenging himself each day. Mm. Beautiful. Like for anyone who's going through it right now, that's that's such a pivotal piece of like, yeah. you can, you have power over your circumstances and they will change so long as you challenge yourself today. Period. And to your point, start small. Yes. I truly believe, Danny, a lot of humans can complete a marathon without training. Will it Will they be sore? Will something potentially happen? Maybe. Yeah. But a lot of people would surprise themselves to be able to complete 26.2 miles. Now, the smarter way 
is what you just said. People haven't seen my YouTube channel when I made videos three years ago. A Murph every single day, which basically got me 60 miles for the month. 2,000 jump ropes, which created a level of elasticity in my calf, soleus, Achilles, which helps you as a runner. I did all these things as base building, build the base. Danny's mantra when he first started running. Yeah. And it has then allowed me to be able to have tissue tolerance and to have a body that's been able to withstand mileage and all these things. So for someone that lacks the confidence, that doesn't have a structure, that doesn't have a friend that might push them to that envelope, you can start with yourself. And maybe that is you just going out and walking a mile. That could be someone's foundation for 30 days and then you build off of that. So I think for people that, whoever's listening to this, if you feel like you're in that rut, just ask yourself, like, what can you control today? What can you start with right now? And stay consistent with it over a 30-day period, a 60-day period, and you will see results in some capacity. It might not be instant. It's no different than everyone right now is going back to the gym. Everyone's getting back into shape. They're trying to. Everyone's doing the 75 hard. Can you actually do that for 365? And it doesn't have to be a complete obsession of just fitness only, but an obsession about growing as yourself. And I think personal growth is the most selfless thing we can do because it, sh it helps us show up as the best version of ourselves, which impacts hundreds to thousands to potentially millions. Yeah. And you are the light. Like you have a light within you that people can feel when they're in your orbit or just feel when they're interacting with you. When was the first sign yourself that you knew you were the light or had the light within you? There's one moment where Growing up, I played sports a lot. That was my, like, that was me and my brother's ticket because we grew up with a single mom. She didn't really know how else to, like, kind of put male role models in our lives. The first moment was the first year I ever played flag football, Danny. My mom didn't want me to play tackle, and she was, before that, made me play soccer. Nonetheless, I played football, flag football the first time, and I had an unbelievable season, statistically. But even more so, just like my energy as a human at 10 years old, that aura, that energy of cultivating people, having people wanting to be part of the team, doing extracurricular activities outside of practice and all those things. That was a moment where the light bulb hit first at 10 years old when I was playing football, which was my passion. Wow. From there, football has always been the vehicle for me. And it was where I'm at my most comfort. It's where I feel as if I could be on and I can be who exactly who I am with no judgment. And even through high school and college, I felt similar moments where my house in college used to be the house that the whole squad would come just kick back at. Of course. And it would just be one of those things where I didn't realize what was, what was actually happening. I was like, oh, this is just normal. But then I started realizing it's not actually. Some teammates you never see outside of practice, outside of study hall, but it's creating an environment where you bring people together. And that's been who I, who I am, even at that young age at 10, through high school, through college. And now, obviously, as where I'm sitting now, we can do it through online. We can do it in real life. You can do it in so many different ways. But those are some moments where I just kind of knew, I'm like, damn, like maybe the energy I bring, Danny, but both in a positive and a negative way, has an impact. Because equally, when I was in college, when I would have my teammates around, equally, I would have a poor relationship with our coach. And I would be talking shit on our coach. Wow. I would be being, I would bring the negative feedback. So as much power as I knew that I had positively, wow. I was actually doing the opposite of it by bringing people together and bringing negativity to the table. So I think for anyone that has that level of aura, you have to understand are you using it in a good way or a bad way? And Danny, those moments in college were some of them, they were dark moments for me in the sense that I felt alone in a, t in a time where I had so many options. Right? Same and. More. What do you mean by that? In the sense that like, it was the first time that my passion and my love started not to become that thing anymore. Football was almost a job and I was not producing the same level of results as I was used to, which was then impacting my mental, which was then impacting the way I acted outside of the four walls of the locker room, which then curates this negativity of, oh, our coaches suck. This is our coach's fault. And being a victim, all the shit that I preach about that I'm not doing now is coming from a place where I used to be that way with the victim's mentality. The same college kid that was mad that they didn't get PT, was mad that they weren't part of the offense, that they weren't getting enough catches, that they weren't getting this and that. And you see it in the NFL, you see it every at every level you see it. But to answer your question, those were the moments where I realized that like, as I can have the influence I want on the world, 
But what influence is it going to be? Positive or negative? And in college, it started to veer more negative. And I started realizing that that was from a insecurity. That was from a toxicity from myself. And that was what I was feeding to the world. Yeah. And your joy for yourself was based on your external results. Period. And so people today might be listening to this and they might say, I'm only successful if I hit a three-hour marathon. I'm only successful if I have this many followers on social media. I'm only successful if I have this amount of much money in my bank account or this car or wear this type of clothing. What do you tell those people? The quicker you live for intrinsic motivation, the more happy you'll be. Yes. I think- How do you flip the script to get to intrinsic motivation? It's realizing that you can't live your life based on the opinions of other people. Mm. I, I think that's like, dude, when I was in those early stages of my first corporate job, I can't tell you how much Gary Vaynerchuk I consumed. Love that. Love that. Dude, I have so much of Gary downloaded into my software that. that it helped me, it helped me, not that I didn't have those things, Danny. I felt like I had some of these beliefs already, mm-hmm. but it helped me get to the point where I felt confident at 25 to say, this is who I am and this is how I'm going to continue. This is how I'm going to show up to the world. I'm not going to live like I'm in high school still. I'm intentionally choosing to live based on how I see myself, not how the world sees me. And it was in these moments of consuming Gary and consuming Jay Shetty and just like other mentors that I have that were part of my board of advisors that I never knew. Who was that? Just so people can get a sense. A mixture mixture of Jay Shetty, of, of, of... Jesse Itzler yeah. of G- Gary Vaynerchuk, um, Naval Ravikant. Like yeah. those are four core that I feel like I just started to consume their messaging and I made it my own. Yeah. But to your, to your point of like, how does someone get to that point? You need to have a level of self-love, right? If you don't love who you are, if you don't love the person you see in the mirror, then of course you're going to believe someone else's opinion. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And you know who else, who else was in there was Russ, the artist Russ. I love Russ. Period. I love that. I love that you love Russ. Um, But it's just, I think it's perspective as well, right? And obviously what I just set up, yeah, having a level of self-love will get you to a point where, oh, I need to actually respect myself more than what Joe Smo or someone on Instagram saying about who I am. Because if if I'm letting this little tweet or this comment from a stranger get to me, what's going to happen when my fiance or my girlfriend or my mom or my brother, what if, if they are saying some shit to me, what's that going to sound like? What's that going to feel like? Right? So I think the people closest to you, you should respect their opinion a little bit more than someone that's a stranger online. But above everyone else's opinion, you need to be able to respect your own. And that comes from a level of confidence and awareness and a self-esteem that can't be unwavering from the outside world. And I think for me, it was consuming a lot of those people but then Danny, the biggest thing is putting it into practice. Mm-hmm. Like, how do you show up for yourself? That says so much about how much you see about who you are, whether that's your physical health, whether that's your mental health, whether that's what you do in your world, right? Like, like, are you waking up with purpose every single day? Those things are all forms of self-love. What you do with your money, what you do with planning for the future. There's so many elements of how to cultivate self-love. It's not just plunging and sauna and running. And like, yeah. those are small elements that can move the needle. You could do all those things while hating yourself. Period. There's plenty of people that have six packs that have hate for themselves. Yeah. So I think it's like a, it's this multi-pronged approach of like, it's, it's filling up your buckets of what you value the most and making sure that those things are secure. So everyone has a chink in their armor. We all do. But to have less chinks is a powerful thing. And a lot of those people that helped me get to that mindset, Danny, I mean, like it's, it's honestly, I can't put a number on what that's done for me. Goggins was also in there. Yeah. Goggins played such a pivotal role early on. How so? It was the first time where I actually realized that I wasn't pushing myself out of my comfort, Danny. Uh-huh. You're living in the, the culture of caution. Literally. I understood training from a f- standpoint of playing college football. I was working on getting a training certificate to train people. But the thought of doing something like running, doing something that is like so like, I couldn't tell you the last time I ran a mile yeah. before four years ago. So I think Goggins just gave me this ability to not just stay hard and, and like who's going to carry the boats. Yes, these are good mantras, but to really lean into like, what does that look like? What does discomfort look like? Mm. And in those moments, 
run, attempting the first marathon, doing the four by four by 48, I started to build this confidence in myself that like, oh shit, this guy isn't unbelievable. He's just a man. He puts on shorts and pants just like I do. And that gave me this level of confidence of when I was at my mom's house making these videos and making YouTube and when no one watched my shit, Danny, I just knew that like the Dame thing, it was just a matter of time. <laughs> Because I felt like the impact that I was going to make was going to be something. I don't care if it was for 5,000 people or 100 people or thousands of people. Like, it didn't matter. It's just that I knew that I was working on myself, which was then allowing others to do the same. What do you do then when the perception shifts? Oh, okay, Matt's making these videos and 10 people are watching. And now there's a million people watching, let's say. And now how does that change what the external forces are coming to you with? And like, how does... How do you stay grounded while the exposure increases? I think two of the entrepreneurs I really look up to talk about death a lot. Mm. Hormozy and Gary. Yeah. And uh, Gary said this one thing about Kobe Bryant that really made me realize, Danny, that like followers, this shit, like doesn't mean much. <laughs> like honestly to the point Danny that like if something happens to me god forbid knock on wood accident incident whatever how many of my followers are going to come to my funeral and it's not from like a dark point that like, I hate my followers it's not that at all it's just that you ask me how do I stay grounded in a world of so many distractions in a world of extrinsic motivation it's understanding that like if something happens to me tomorrow maybe a couple people might be sad a couple people might be they might come to the funeral actually but Danny a week from now People are so worried about their own shit that they're going to move on. No different than the impact that Kobe Bryant had. And I think I think about that in the sense that like it keeps me level-headed. It keeps me grounded in, in, in who I am as a human. I just want to, I feel like I'm showing up the same way I did four years ago. Mm. It's the same attitude. No different than not needing a new car. No different than not needing to wear flashy clothes to show that I'm winning. It's literally just me saying like, this is who I am and this is how I'm going to show up. While also understand that, yeah, am I making impact in the world? I hope so. I hope that people are getting impacted. I hope that it, that's true. At the same time, if something did happen to me, people would move on. Besides my closest family members and friends that would actually show up, that would you know feel fucking sad and that would have all those emotions. Outside of that, Danny, it's like, that's what I think of. It keeps me grounded in a level of humility and self-awareness that we're all beings in this world, but at the end of the day, there's billions of us. And ultimately, you can't continue to live for all these external things because at the end of the day, there's only a few select people that are actually going to be there when you're six feet under. Wow. Yeah, that's that's powerful perspective. And it, and it just goes to show like your humility and your confidence. I, I also love to, to point out like you downloaded the software. Like I love how you have that phrase of like- I that, love that, that phrase. That, that software is in my head because- I always say to people like, who's the happiest person you know, or who's the person who's exuding the most love or the most connection to God? Literally just, if you thought and said all of the same thoughts that they did, you would also think all of the same thoughts that they do, and you might be just as happy. You might be just as loving and free. And so if you, I like, and I've also been thinking about like, really what the gift is, is your ability to recognize that in others. Right? Like we have a very similar board of mentors, or we did when we were just getting started or growing up. And it's yeah. like, we saw the light in Gary Vaynerchuk. We saw the light in Russ. We saw the light in Jay Shed. We saw the light in Goggins and Itzler, right? Like we see the light in people. How can people get better at seeing the light in others? Mm. I love that. I think it's, it's rooted in two things, Danny. One, a level of open-mindedness yeah. and curiosity. Mm -hmm. And those two words are very similar. Being open-minded in the sense that maybe there is a different way to think. Maybe there is a different way to consume content, to consume information. You know how many people told me like Gary's b bullshit. I watch his reels. So yeah, he gets me hype. I'm like, well, how much of Gary have you really consumed? I can't tell you how many four D's I've consumed, how many marketing tactics, how many like books and things that actually are practical. Gary's message is so practical. Yeah. You have to consume enough of it outside of the noise of Instagram to actually understand it though. Agreed. And I think for people that it's no different than, it's like a disciple, 
we talk about religion, we talk about politics, like, like being a disciple of Gary, a disciple of Russ, a disciple of Goggins, it's because you've actually, you've gone further than just the, the bird's eye. Yeah. You went deep. Yeah. You have to go deeper into someone's content to fully extract their gems and their knowledge. So for someone that's just like, oh, I'm just like, I'm, I'm consuming a lot of Hormozy right now. Well, like how much of Hormozy are you consuming? Are you consuming his 60 second clip or are you going down his deep dives of, of how he's marketing or how he's utilizing his book as an example of his whole marketing framework, mm. right? So I think it's a matter of patience as well, mm. of mixed with curiosity and being open-minded. So many people think that they have the answer already before they consume someone's thing. If you're going in with that mindset, then you're not gonna be going in with a framework of learning. You're going in stubborn. So I think that's also where you have to start fresh. People think they want to be curious until they get to the point of curiosity and then it's questioning their old frameworks. Yeah. Right? And yeah. I think I see it all the time. It's like I see with close people that are close to me. I see people that ask me these questions. I'm like, you have to understand that like you're going into it with a jaded point of view. You're not really seeking curiosity because if you were, then you'd be asking different questions. You'd show up into the room differently and you'd show up trying to listen more than you speak. <laughs> So I think that's all mixed in with like, all right, well, if you're someone that's like, oh, I don't know. I mean, like, it's like, I, I've, I've seen so many people's stuff. Well, I'm like, how much have you actually seen? Dude, that is such a great point. Because if I think about all the things that I've shifted my mind on, I was taking other people's perspectives and making it greater than my own because I didn't want to do the work of actually exploring that thing. If I think about the Bible, which I've started to read, I'm like, oh my God, there's so much wisdom here that I was shutting off because I grew up without it. And I assumed that the Bible was this document that was so old and that it was definitely wrong. And I didn't even know myself. I hadn't explored it. If I think about running, it was like, oh, well, that seems like it'd be difficult and it's not for me. And because other people have said that, it's like, dude, you haven't even tried running a hundred times. Like, what are we doing here? When it was content or podcast, it's like all the same shit. Stop same taking shit. other people's perspectives Period. and and start actually exploring for yourself if it's for you. But why don't you? Because you're scared to fail. Period. And Danny, what, what did I say earlier? <laughs> you want to see amazing results? <laughs> Build your relationship with failure. Yes. Like that is actually where this shit all starts. Yes. Build your relationship with failing. Be comfortable with posting that thing and 10 people seeing it and saying that's a failure. That's the actually the win because you posted. But it's like if you're viewing that as the failure in that moment, great. Now you've step one. Now you've done one. That's uh, actually the formula for success. What's the formula? Getting more comfortable with failure. Mm. I truly believe that. And that could be from asking the girl that you think is pretty out. That could be from posting the video that sucks. That could be from stepping out and, and getting out of your gym routine and running. Or if you're a runner, get into the gym and lift. If you're a lifter, go do Pilates. Like, like put yourself in a position where you are a student. You want to seek curiosity? Go learn. The reason I want to do so much of it, Danny, is because I cheated through school. Like, I, that, that was a core moment for me because I never applied myself through college or high school. So now I'm trying to make up time and I'm trying to learn as much as possible. And it's always by putting myself in a room where I am the dumbest person. This morning, I worked out with Jay and Steph and I had no idea what I was doing. I had to ask. I had to. I had, they had to break down each movement like a baby, one by one by one, to then allow me to connect all these things together to then go do the full movement. And I think that's important for every single human, no matter if you're 20 and you're just starting, no matter if you're 35 and you have kids, no matter if you're 55 and you built five businesses, like there's no excuse to not continue to learn if Mark Cuban is, if Jesse Itzler is, if, if Goggins, if Gary, like the most successful people in the world have this framework. Now, that doesn't mean that everyone needs to have this framework, but if you want more out of who you are, if you feel like you're tapped out of like, oh my God, I don't know what I'm, I don't know why I'm waking up every single day. I'm going to the job. I'm making good money. I have the dog. I have the kids. Like if you want more, then put yourself back in the mode of learning and failing. And I think that right there is something that I don't want to lose. And my challenge every single year, no matter how many followers I have, no matter how much I've grown is to be a student. You're doing a damn good job of it. How are you, what are you learning? in 2024, what's the number one thing or what are some of the buckets you want to learn in? Yeah, I mean, I think there's two things. It's, we talked about relatability. I think for me, like so much of content and so much of this journey is about storytelling. I wanna learn how I can storytell outside of the realm of what I've known for, mm. period. Everyone, Everyone's like, yo, you're that runner guy, you're the TikTok guy. And like, I don't think that's a slap in the face. Like, I just, I just, I just think that that is what it is. Yeah. 
at this moment. At this moment. And that's okay. Like I'm going to live a long time and I'm going to make, I'm going to have so many iterations of who I am that, you know, I, I forgot where I, I heard this from Danny, but it was like, uh, you know, as humans, we're capable of like 15 different lives. Yes. But the thing is, and it was actually in the book with Gary Keller, one thing mm. where it talked about like, yeah, you could be an author, you could be a podcaster, you can be a, a co-host, you can be a writer and you can do all these things and you could do it in one lifetime, but you can't do it all at once. Mm. You need to build your skill set, your specialty. And once you build that to then be able to go learn something new, that's actually the steps of becoming a runner and then becoming a media company and then becoming a trainer and then becoming a restaurant host, a chef, a podcast. Like you can do all these things, but you have to understand that it's gonna take time and discipline. And I heard that, I'm like, that's so true. And my mentor has been in my ear about, Matt, keep the main thing, the main thing. And that's always been his advice. When I call him sometimes, I'm always like, I kind of know what he's gonna say, but I'm just gonna ask, you know? <laughs> and I love that because I think so many people, they wanna bite off more than they can chew. Mm. I wanna go speak in front of the stage. I wanna host a podcast. I wanna write a book. I wanna go read the Bible. I wanna go do all these things. I wanna run five marathons. And I'm like, okay, that's great. Ambition is great. But there's levels of practicality that we all have to have and understand that, hey, life happens. You're gonna be busy. You're gonna to wanna to go out on dates. You're gonna to wanna to go hang out with your family. Mm. You're gonna to wanna to do these things. So maybe setting goals that are more attainable in the, set, in the sense that, like, let me build this skill set first and then let me stack on these other things. So to answer your question, I wanna relaunch my pod this year Let's go. and have a different realm of what that looks like. I had it during COVID and I made 50 episodes, which is more than most, but it's not great. And I also wanna write a book. So much of what I've done in 23 was journal more. Mm -hmm. For me, I'm not the best writer because back in school, I just didn't, I didn't do a good job of actually applying it. And even journaling for me has been a muscle that I'm trying to develop. And in 2023, it started with the five minute journal. Then I actually just bought an open book journal and I would just write out my thoughts in the morning or at the end of the day and just kind of like, sometimes it would just be talk about what happened. And it's as simple as that. It's not like this, like, oh my God, these abstract business plans, you know? It's just like, no, I'm literally just debriefing. What are core things I, I went through today? What are thoughts I had? What are fun memories I had with people that made me feel like, yo, I'm gonna look back and be like, I remember December 31st, 23. I remember X, Y, and Z, you know? So I would say those are things, and they're all in that same realm of what I said of storytelling. I wanna storytell in a different capacity. Dude, it's so crazy that you mentioned storytelling as a thing because I sent you a tweet that I wrote about the marathon that we ran. I loved it. And I was like, Twitter's my place. And you corrected me and you said, storytelling is your place. Period. And it's like, that I think is an important thing for people to think about. And a few aha moments in my life are the result of someone taking something that I was doing and expanding it. So like, for example, my friend L said to me once, I said to her, my, my medium is podcasting. And she said, no, I think your medium is live, like live experience and live people and being with people live. It's like, yeah, that resonates. And when, when you said, when I said Twitter's my place to you and you said storytelling is your place, I was like, that's it. And that's such a secret to life mm. because we have the tendency to box ourselves into mm. places, into skills. I am a runner, not I am an athlete. I am an athlete, not I am an entrepreneur athlete. I am an entrepreneur athlete, not I am an artist entrepreneur athlete. Like we, like just expand the pie a little bit yeah. for your place or your comfortability and watch what happens. Dude, you read my mind. I love that. We're on the I, same wavelength. It's so true though. And 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 then that's exactly what I thought when I sent that text to you, that you're so much more than just on Twitter. It's ludicrous. That literally, that's like selling yourself so short. I'm like, what? Nonetheless, I think for most humans, Odani, it, that's like the truest thing. It's society already is trying to do it. Mm. This comes back to self-love. Mm. I love how all these moments are coming back to what we've been talking about. This is self-love. The highest form of self-love is being able to get it out of yourself, right? When you don't allow yourself to be put in a box, you allow, you don't allow society to do it either mm. or your parents or anyone that's around you. And you have to believe in your heart that, yeah, I'm more than just on Twitter. I'm more than just a football player. I'm more than just a runner because everyone in the world is gonna tell you that you are. And if you start to believe it, then it will be true. 
But it's your job as humans to put your foot down and say, no, I could be whoever I want to be. I'm just a creative. I'm just a storyteller, period. That's it. That's where the sentence stops. Do I now do these other things? A hundred thousand percent. You're right. But I think as it's our duty because if no one else is going to do it for, if no one else is going to, how can you expect other people to believe in you if you don't believe in yourself? And believing in yourself is expanding the label Period. or what you are allowing yourself to experience. 100%. I mean, dude, how many people do we know that are killers in business that don't think they can take that same level of grit and apply it to their health, apply it to their family, apply it to whatever. And the same could be said about an athlete that, dude, you, you literally are spectacular at this one thing. Now let's build this skill set into the next thing. And like that, I think is something that's an internal barrier. It's an internal box that society has put on us where it's shut up and dribble, where it's, hey, just just stay in your lane, right? You're, you talk politics, just talk politics. Like you can't talk finance and investing and then you can't come on pods. And like, it's, it's ludicrous to think that way. So, and Danny, I thought that way. Of course, that's why you, co you come to these conclusions today. So what was the switch or the aha? Uh -huh it, it was, it was, dude, f football was my identity. Mm. Once I got done, I said to myself, okay, well, like, I guess I'm just going to be working a corporate job. <laughs> like, it's hilarious to think about, but right now, by the way, dude, hundred percent. that was what, four years ago, four five years ago, years? five years ago. I mean, Danny, even when I was working that corporate job, this is when I first started consuming Gary and I knew that I wasn't going to be there long. Internally, I knew. Mm. The, the conversations I had with coworkers, I knew they were like, yo, like, dude, they're like, you're, you're pretty sharp and you're like pretty young. And I'm like, I didn't need that validation, but I just knew that I was, I was spending time outside of the office to develop who I am as a human period. So someone's listening to this right now and they're in that office job. That's why they're listening to this because they see people who are maybe three or four years in front of and where they want to be someday. What is the advice? that we can give them? I mean, there's so many, there's so many ways I can take this. I think if I think about where I was at that moment, it's like, I think you and I talked about this of, in the book of James, there's a, there's a piece of it talking about being a listener, being a hearer, and then being a doer. Mm. And I've talked about being a good listener, and I think that's a critical component of learning. But I think that you need to take, if someone's listening to this right now, you need to take what you're taking from this pod and other pod, because I'm sure that you can find plenty of other good ones. Take what you listen from those episodes, but then apply it into your actual life. The application is the most practical thing that we can do as humans, and it's where you're gonna see the most results. You don't just become, you don't just change your mindset because you listen to a ton of Gary Vee. You need to then listen to Gary Vee and then apply the tactics and the morals and the values of what he's about. And that goes no different than Kobe Bryant, LeBron James, Russ, whoever someone might look up to. Listen, but then start to take action. And your action, it might be a 1% thing. I'm gonna start to treat myself nicer. I'm gonna wake up a little bit earlier. I'm gonna show up and be positive in my sales room and not negative. Like it could be the smallest thing that compounds. People don't fully grasp what compound interest can actually be. And it's not just in your investment or bank accounts. Like it happens in everyday life. And showing up for yourself mixed with all that, I think, and all, honestly mixed with all that, like that is showing up for yourself. Learning. Applying is a form of self-love. And I think that's what I would say for someone that's like, oh my God, I'm working the nine to five, I'm getting paid well, but I know that there's more. Okay, well then start to put things into action because you can read the books and you can listen to the podcast and people think that that's like, that's growth. Mm -hmm. That's one part of it. That's one piece. That's downloading the software. And then you have to go do it. And I always love the Matrix thing because like it's the, it's, it's, I love the Matrix and it was the first R-rated movie my, my mom let me and my brother see. Let's go. And when Neo got plugged in for the first time and he learned jujitsu, he learned it in 15 seconds. And we don't live in that level of speed yet, but with AI and with all these different podcasts and books that can get summarized in 15 minutes, like you can get that in a form where you can get it in 15 to 30 minutes. And then you can start go doing it. You can change your attitude. You can change how you show up to work. You can change your mindset. You can be open-minded and, and stop being closed off. You can be abundant instead of scarce. You can be optimistic instead of pessimistic. Like there's all these practical things that start to move the needle. Dude, I just got chills because 
if someone ran across Korea 50 years ago, the only way you would have seen them or known about them is maybe through a book or maybe through TV for a one minute or two minute segment. And now you get the exact playbook from the person who did it in their energy, thanks to podcasts, videos, YouTube, like what a wild world we're living in that only in the last 10 years has really started to exist of hearing someone's voice and hearing their energy and hearing their video and watching unfold how they did the crazy stuff that they did and make you realize maybe it's not so crazy after all. And so it's elevating the human. And so what the reason why I bring that up is because it's like downloading the matrix software is like people are downloading the matrix software. This is what it, it took to run across Korea in 10 days with running for three years or four years. That would be unfathomable to most people in 2004. Yeah. 2014, they're like, what? Like, maybe I heard one Rogan podcast about this. And now it's like, here's Matt Choi. You know, and that this is a new thing. This is a new phenomenon. And so we're getting better at downloading the program and we're getting better at hearing more voices and understanding I'm a human being. You're a human being. And we're just doing the best we can. And the person listening on the other end is also just a human being, which means that they're capable, likely, of far more than they realize. Period. We live in the information age, Danny. And it'd be a, it'd be a waste to not utilize it. Mm. And I think that's where most people find themselves. It's information overload without actually putting it into work. To your point, the fact that this, you know, there's not a, a long list of people that ran across America. It's like in the 300s. 500 something yeah, maybe. It's in, it's in the 300s. Wow. So even that, people have moved the envelope. Yeah. That has become more of a common thing. If you look at the marathon, the first person ever ran it ended up dying. Yeah. Sending a message from Athens to Greece. Now think about it. People run marathons every day. People run them 10 days in 10 days, 10, 10 marathons in 10 days, 12 in 12 months, like one a year. Like as humans, we've all evolved. Yeah. And the envelope will continue to get pushed. And it's how it should be. Like the human, the, the evolution of humans should continue to get more stronger. It should get more challenging. And like that, that should be how it, how it goes. We're all getting smarter. And we have to because of technology. And what's really changed? It's like our access to information, but our brain has stayed the same, which leads me to believe maybe our thoughts have just created this new reality. Like our thoughts have allowed us to, oh, maybe I can run a marathon tomorrow. Our thoughts allowed us to say, oh, maybe I could run across Korea. Whereas before it was like, no, I can never do that. Yeah. Like, I mean, special. Dude, when the first four minute mile got broken, everyone started. So I'm, I'm watching, bro, I'm watching the Korea doc and I'm like, <laughs> you're never, you're I was never. like, could I run across America? You're like, what would that take? Okay, like, let's start running. You know, like, if Matt did it, why can't I? Period. Right? So I think you're really doing a huge service to so many people by living the way you are living with light and with determination and work ethic and documenting it all with your infectious personality. Like, you truly are a gift to humanity. And I don't know if you've really seen the ripples of what, is entailed from doing that. And that's that's such an exciting thing to be to witness and be your friend along the journey. I'm humbled, man. I, I truly appreciate the the kind words. And um it, it I mean, Dan, honestly, it's it's I get in my cocoon at times. Yeah. And I just don't like it, the external noise doesn't like enter my framework. Yeah. But I've seen it at races and marathons and Obviously, I've, I've, I've received messages and, and in-person interactions, and it, it's amazing. And yet, I still feel like I'm just getting started. Because you are. <laughs> That's the truth. Both of us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm curious, just to like drive home the point about being the light, there were things in the way that were insecurities that you had to break through to truly be the person sitting across from me right now. What is one or two that you could point to that is like, this is the truth of who I am. And this, uncovering this and being able to speak about this is part of the reason why I am so light. Mm. I mean, I think the first thing would be just the way that I grew up and not having a male role model to actually like base what I believe is the right way to act as a man. Not having that in my house was something that was an insecurity for me. It's why I got so obsessed 
with sports wow. because it was an opportunity for me to say, is this the right coach to look up to? Mm. Is this the right coach that can believe in a bigger version of who I actually am or a better version of who I am or planting a seed in terms of what I can actually achieve? Every single person in their life has someone like that. And I'm not saying I'm sitting here in trauma and I'm like, oh my God, I, I, I wish I had my dad. It's, it's just, no, it's just like, that's a moment for me that it's, it's why I got obsessed with sports and it's why I have this mindset of trying to give it back. And my mom did a great job of raising me and my brother, but she did the best job as she could as a single mom, trying to be a male role model and a, and, and a motherly role model. Mm -hmm. But coaches and role models that I had growing up were those pieces for me. And whether they knew it or not, I mean, I think about my high school coach the most. He literally made me believe in a vision that I couldn't see for myself. How do you do that? By planting the seed my freshman year of saying that, Matt, if you actually take football seriously and your academics seriously, you will have a chance at the end of the four years here to earn a college scholarship. And when you're in ninth grade, Danny, it's nothing. You have no offers. You haven't played a, a snap on varsity. So many things can happen in four years. That started to manifest, but it lit a fire in my heart to say, I'm going to give every single ounce and just see if I have what it takes. And even like in moments where I started to struggle in school and I just like, it wasn't even struggling. It was more just not, it was like dicking around. It was being a class clown. Cheating. It was cheating. Right. It was not really like applying myself. And then obviously I would get, my mom would get the typical calls from teachers and or my coach saying like, yeah, this is the situation. And my mom would be like, you're not going to play football. And like, that would be her way of saying, I'm going to pull this passion from you and until you give me a little bit, until you meet me halfway. And then I obviously started to re realize that life's about balance. When was that around? This was in sophomore year. 10th and grade. 10th grade. Gotcha. And this is why I feel like I live a balanced life now of not being so extroverted or introverted, not being so conservative and progressive. Like, like I truly feel like the beauty is in the middle. And as humans, you have to be open-minded to seek both. You have to be open-minded to lean into both and have empathy for both people. Because at the end of the day, they're valid. Both sides can be true, but you don't have to believe in both, right? Yeah. And in that moment, it was football and school. I was going so hard, Danny, 99% football, 1% school. Wow. Where even for me, going 70, 30 is enough of a balance. And then you start teetering 65, 35, and then you find what works. But to answer your question, that was the one insecurity for me of not having the person, not having the role model at home and always trying to seek it outside of the house, which might tell someone, or might make someone think like, oh, like I feel like Matt would want more outside validation because he didn't have that. Hmm. But my mom validated me enough. And I had people in my, my family and like friends that would validate me. And not that I needed it, I already knew what I was building and what I was working for. And it was to earn a college scholarship. That was my North Star in high school, is that I am going to earn a college scholarship to go play. That was my North Star. And once it happened, I started realizing like, oh, this is the fruits of your labor. And it's so cool because the thing that you felt like you lacked is actually your greatest gift. You are that male role model for so many people. You are the person who people can turn to their page and get inspiration, get positivity, get a thoughtfulness and get a middle. Like we talked about this on our run as well. It's like the reason why we are like we are, we see so many different perspectives me and you, because of putting out content for years on the internet, that we now are able to relate to more people because we see this perspective. Oh, this person's super progressive there. I like that. Or this person's super conservative. I like that. And so like both can be true. Mm -hmm. And we meet in the middle because we see different aspects of life. And uh, I, th I think that's, it's so cool to see that you are that male role model. And also you have so many different perspectives and that gives you the ability to cater to more and more people. You know, one of the last things I'll say is uh, it's allowed me to be a better leader, Danny. Yeah. You know, when we, went, when we were in Korea, it was funny how like our driver we had just met, his name's Felix. And at the very end, he said something that actually truly made me realize that like, this is actually who I am. And it's another Gary thing of everyone has my trust until they lose it. Mm -hmm. During this trip, I had my brother, who was basically mainly operations and he did iPhone footage. I had my buddy Ahmed who did all YouTube footage, horizontal, and then I had 
my buddy Felix, who drove and did all operational stuff, booking hotels, getting food, doing laundry, all the dirt work. Nonetheless, he also was like treasurer. Like I gave him my credit card and he would have to go buy everything. So <laughs> this was a straight stranger, Danny. I had met him 24 hours before we started, right? Could you tell that story after? Of course. Yeah. And I am not the type of leader that's going to micromanage. I truly believe to get the best out of every single human, you need to allow them to use their gift. And that's in that whatever gift that they have to offer, you have to let them utilize it. I will always be willing and be bold enough to provide feedback and things I want in a certain way. But I'll never say you need to make this edit here or this needs to be this exact way. I don't like how you color graded this or X, Y, and Z. I gave my credit card to Felix. I said, I have full faith in you. Do whatever you need to do. And at the very end of the trip, one of the questions that we had asked them, and it, 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 so much was in the documentary, right? Because 46 minutes is already a long video. And he had said that the way that Matt led was in such a servant leadership, allowing people to utilize their skill sets. He just, when he gave, he literally said, when, I, when he gave me his credit card and he gave me this trust that I wasn't going to go steal all their stuff, that I wasn't going to use his money to go buy whatever I want. I mean, Danny, we left, this, we left the one guy that we knew the least with all of our shit, <laughs> all of our bags. Everything that I owned, laptop to cameras to equipment, everything was in the vehicle that he had control over. All I was running was my clothes. But it was having that level of faith in humans because ultimately, if you don't, then you're always going to be skeptical. You're always going to be having a scarcity mindset that, oh my God, what if they steal my shit? Well, if you think that, then you're putting that negativity in the world. Like I truly believe that every human is a great human until they prove to me that they're not. Yeah. And I did the same thing with my brother and the same thing with Ahmed. Like I never told them what they needed to shoot or what they had to do. It's like, I'm already only focused on one step at a time and completing this mission from the physical standpoint. I don't have enough time and energy to say that you need to do it my way or this way or his way or her way. Like I just, and it's actually how I show up even with people that are in, that work for me, whether they're contractors or, or people in my ecosystem. It's like, I want to empower people to do the things that light them up on fire because I live in that fashion and I want to give people that light to do the same because I truly believe that you show up into the world oh, in, in a different way. The energy you show up into the room is different. The, the interactions you have are different. And people feel that whether they know you or not, they just want a little taste of it. And that could just be the cashier at Kawabs. Right. That could be the cashier at the bank or whoever it is. And in that moment, when Felix said that, I'm like, it, it, was, a, it, was, it was dope because he felt that. Yeah. And he was someone that I had known for 24 hours prior. Dude, crazy. Do, do you have any bit of you that's like, you can, you can read the intuition. You can, you have an intuition on God. people. Like, Danny. because that's a huge part of it too. Like, for sure. Yeah, I, I do look at the best in humanity. I look at oh, the best of in every course, situation. Of course. But like, you literally met this man and your intuition was like, all right, I want him to drive me. Or I, I trust this man with my credit card. Like, that's a different level of trust and intuition of what this meant. 100% Danny. I mean, I, you know, emotional intelligence is like gotten more popular. And I think that there's levels of emotional intelligence of, yeah, you can understand body language and you can understand, you know, how to like talk to someone if they're feeling down or if they're happy or how to find the middle or whatever it might be. But I think the highest level of EQ is from different formats, not just from friend standpoint, from leadership, from being an employee as well, from understanding how do I get my, how do I get the best out of my boss? Yeah. And how do I get the best out of clients or brands or whatever the situation might be? There's something in Korean culture called nunchi, nunchi, which basically means like, like it, it's like having an idea of like in, like intent, mm. right? It's like having an idea of like, oh yeah, like how do you how do you know how you have trust in someone? It's like having a good idea on like body language and all those things of like I just have a good eye for it, you know? That's kind of what it, like the saying of it. And to your point, I feel like I have that in a lot of people. I don't have to meet someone for three hours to know like, damn, the per the way that this person shows up, they're a good fucking human. Yeah. They're a positive person. They're, they, they might not even be the most positive, but they're just a good dude. I, I, I can see how they're maybe a little bit more introverted and they stick to themselves, but yet they're just a good human and I can kind of see it. And sometimes you're wrong, right? It's life. Be, be okay with failure. Be okay with maybe trusting too much. And then people screw you over at yeah. times. That's okay too. That's a, le a lesson. It, it's a, a lesson. But yeah. I truly think that more times than not, I have an idea of like, damn, like th th I, 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 for whatever reason, this person is giving me an energy that I feel like I can trust, that I have faith in. And for him, it was exactly that. Like, you know why I knew Danny? Because instantly when I started explaining that the situation that we're in, 
I don't have an international permit. No one on my team had an international permit. We can't drive a car in Korea. And the first thing Felix does is he grabs his laptop out and starts searching. He says, oh, Matt, um, the, the DMV opens on Monday. You can go in on Monday at eight o'clock and, 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 and apply for one. I said, I said, Felix, I don't have time. Like I need to, I want to start on Sunday. And he said, okay. He said, uh, he said, yeah, you're probably right because it's going to take uh, 24 hours to get, get, get it approved anyway. So his intent, even in that moment was, I want to help. Mm. In the back of his mind, he probably knew that the biggest way for him, him to help was to drive and to be the fucking translator. And then also he's a photographer and he could also shoot. Oh my God. So Wait, him- but tell that story like in full so people can get a sense. Yeah. So I'm in Korea and some people might not know this about me, but like I'm very laissez-faire, Danny. Like I don't plan all the things because I actually leave room for spontaneity. And with something like this, Danny, 300 miles, there's a lot of room for error if you leave up too much room for spontaneity. I go to Korea on a Thursday. I land and I had been connecting with my buddy Isaiah who lives out in Korea. He's half, he's three quarters black, one quarter Korean. He's lived there for six years. And he was helping me plan a lot of the logistics, like getting me in touch with people that had done this in the past or had biked it or um, people that were willing to give up a van. And long story short, I'm meeting Isaiah at a coffee shop at 5 p.m. Knowing me, people, if you know me, I was running a little bit late. 20 minutes and Isaiah goes, I, I go, yo, I'm running a little bit behind. The train was late. And he goes, dude, don't sweat it. I just bumped into a friend of mine at the coffee shop. I truly believe God put all of us in that moment together to share that opportunity. Him and Felix start talking and he tells Felix like who, who, who like who he's meeting. He's like, yeah, there's this English, there's this American dude. He's trying to run Seoul to Busan. And a year prior, Felix biked Seoul to Busan. I didn't know. Guess what, whose bike he used? Isaiah's. Oh my God. So that connection was already there. Felix is from UK. He's lived in Korea for two years. Prior to that, lived in Japan. So he's fully like, he's immersed himself into the Korean culture, even more than Isaiah. Like he's, his girlfriend's Korean. He speaks fluent Korean. And he's, a, he's a white dude. Wow. He then goes, okay, I'll stick around and, and I'll, I'll, I'll meet the dude. Me, my brother, and my dad show up to the coffee shop. And like, I got to finally meet Isaiah. I had, cause we've only chatted through social and we just started talking and, and we, he's like laying out what he's learned so far. And I'm obviously talking to Felix and he goes, yeah, like Isaiah goes, my buddy, Sean has a vehicle for you guys, a minivan. He said, you, that he's not going to charge you guys. He's going to let you use it for free. And I'm like, dope. In my mind, I'm like one problem with that, <laughs> car. And then next thing I'm like, all right, well, like I was like, I was like, Zay, I'm like, I was like, do you know anyone that can drive? Like I, I'm willing to pay him. Like I, I just, I, we need someone to take us because none of us have permits. And most of the time I'm going to be running. I'm not going to drive anyways. My brother's going to be on a bike. And then Ahmed is going to be in and out of the bike, running, biking, in the car, whatever. And he goes, I, 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 he's like, I talked to Sean. He said he might be able to get some people for like 1200 bucks or 1500 bucks. I'm like, all right, deal, find them. Let's get them. And during this time, Felix is there and he's listening to all this shit. He's listening to the problems that we're f facing and he's searching about the MVA thing. And then he's searching about like, oh, how fast can you find drivers that are just only drivers? Like they literally, like they might not speak to you and they might only be Korean, wow. which we ideally needed a translator, right? So to find a translator, a driver, and then a creative <laughs> all in one is unbelievable. Long story short, Felix ends up leaving, going to a dinner party with his girlfriend. He goes, and the last thing before he left, Zay goes, Felix, like, he's like, why don't you drive? <laughs> and Felix goes, he's like, the funny thing is, is like, I don't have work for the next week or so because he's a freelance model out in Korea. And he literally had nothing on the books for 10 days. And as soon as he said that, I go, Danny, Danny, I go, Felix, I said, you don't know me very well and I don't know you, but I promise you one thing that this is going to be quite the journey. And it seems like you're the missing piece. And I wouldn't, I, I, I forgot exactly what I said, but I said, it would be an honor to have you on this trip. Not only because you obviously have biked this before and not only that because you're a translator, but I think that it's an opportunity for us all to get connected and, and for us to lean further into the culture. And he was like, I'll think about it. I'll shoot Zay a text. And then he leaves and then Zay goes, I think he's going to do it. We all go to get dinner at Korean barbecue three hours later. He gets a text from Felix. He said, I'm in. And when did you start running? And we started running on Sunday. This was, this was Friday night at 8 p.m. Oh and then we started running at 10 a.m. on Sunday. And an instant in that moment, Danny, driver checked, vehicle checked. 
all the logistics in between, Felix took care of. Like we we stayed in like hotels every single night in the new city. And I just knew that this is exactly what I wanted. I wanted the pressure to be on me to physically complete this because now all these things were done. That's it. And like now it's on me of like, all right, you came out here, go seek culture. You came out here, go seek a challenge. I love that. Yeah. Now let's go see what we can do. Yeah. So that was a story of meeting Felix and it, it, unbelievable. I, I couldn't have drawn it up better. I, I don't even think, Danny, if I planned it more, mm -hmm. being in the States, that it would have worked out as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the beauty of putting yourself in an opportunity to maybe fail mm. and to not have all the answers because those moments truly for me are what made this trip special is meeting Felix. It's meeting my buddy, Sean. And like all these things that I truly feel like like God had just like put these people in my life to just allow myself to not only go through a physical feat, but to experience it in a different light. Dude, that story is so incredible. And if you accept the premise that you were exactly where you were in that moment, as well as Felix was exactly where he was supposed to be in that moment, then therefore every moment that is leading up to that moment in your entire life was exactly where you were supposed to be as well. Because how could one be true without the other? Mm. So I think we are all living exactly where we are supposed to be at all times. The universe is unfolding exactly as it is supposed to. And that story is just so remarkable and such a wonderful place to to bring this conversation home. I'm, I'm in awe at Matt Choi, the human being. Thank you for everything you stand for. You are making the world a brighter place. You're an absolute legend. You're a dear friend to me, a brother, and I'm so grateful for you, bro. I appreciate you, man. It's a pleasure to be on here again. Yeah. Where can we send people to connect with Matt um, Choi more? Yeah. I mean, you guys definitely get on the YouTube channel, um, Matt Choi. Check out the documentary if you have any interest in uh, some of the things that we talked about here. Um, and then, yeah, on Instagram and TikTok, Matt Choi underscore six. That's it. All linked below. Thank Let's you go. so much. Love. Peace.